one we are live emily davis how are you well not not too bad can't, can't complain I've, I've got a beer it's friday night um happy friday yeah. yeah yeah how's your week been all right same as same as many other weeks in this weird yeah. new version of life we live in but yeah no, no can't complain it's everything's it's, ticking along. It's sort of it's easier to kind of juggle the weirdness of the pandemic, I think, at the moment, because it feels like we've turned a corner, like it might not be forever. There could be something on the horizon. Yeah. And I'm sort of I've just recently turned 40 and uh, I was thinking like it's one of the it's one of the very few like <laughs> pros at the moment to having like gone over that hill. I'm like, OK, look, I've turned 40. That's bad, kind of bad. But not too far away from the vaccine queue so clinical trial here really i already i've already had my first my first jab wow i felt like i was you know a bit smug there like hey look i'm 40 <laughs> gonna get the vaccine. soon you know no big well, deal I'm 39 so i would have been close Fair. did you get was it like a paid medical trial did you get like uh, no it's not it's not paid it was with queen's college hospital in london and they've been doing it since the beginning of the pandemic and it was testing vitamin d levels and if that had an effect on people who caught it didn't catch it blah 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 and mm. because i did all that they invited me to go for the vaccine so i was like yep i'll i'll take that sweet pretty good deal go yeah. you have you had it yet uh, did you get covid uh, no i never got covid no i got free vitamin d sweet yeah i've been <laughs> fucking mainlining that shit like a coke addict yeah. Uh, yeah, I got I got it all free. It was brilliant. I, yeah, uh, I, I'm hoping that at some point in the not too distant future, like because I've so far I've managed to skate by, not get like we've had a couple of cases of it in my son's school, and then they've just been like, right, that's it, class shut, two weeks, everyone yeah. isolate, and uh, and I've been thinking, you know, maybe we've had it because like how likely is it that they could have two instances of it in a classroom and all the kids like they don't isolate. He's only four. So, you know, maybe we've had it and we just don't know. And then I went and did like the antibody test and uh, no such luck. So I guess we just, I don't know. I would rather have had it and then just got it out of the way, you know? Yeah, it's kind of one of those things. It would be great to have had it, not realised and, and be able to just be like, yeah, I'm done. Done with that. Got, got the antibodies now. No big deal, guys. Got it. Yeah. COVID um, completed it. Done. Yeah. Well, thanks very much for joining me tonight on this uh, chilly Friday evening. Um, no worries. I thought you'd be a really interesting person to chat to uh, because um, this podcast sort of seeks to uh, it seeks to sort of populate the, the the USP, the niche ground, like somewhere between tech and comedy. And mm -hmm. uh, and so each week I, I sort of pick a different subject and we pull it apart and we take like different people's experiences of it and tried to get a few lols on the way uh and so i've i've touched on a few bits and pieces like analytics and uh ai and sex robots and uh, various other stuff but one thing that i haven't touched on yet is streaming and this is an area that's sort of quite close to my heart because of i don't know if i've mentioned this before on on this podcast but i like historically i studied um music industry management and i used to be in bands like everyone in maidenhead uh, i know battle of the bands hey yeah and uh <laughs> yeah. And, then, and then after the band stuff finished then it was like like rap kind of hip hoppy stuff and then it was like some dance anyway like so i i was you know balls deep in music for a long time and i, I still love it um but obviously my exposure to tech and the changing shape of uh the music industry um, has sort of left me in a bit of an awkward place where I love innovation and I love tech, um, but I can't deny or sort of ignore what streaming has done and is continuing to do to the music industry and to to what then becomes the music music industry in the next sort of, you know, two to five years or whatever. What does it look like? Yeah. Yeah. Like, where does this go sort of thing? Um, so I, I don't know, like maybe a good place to start would be to get an understanding of um, like the business that you work for and uh, and how streaming has impacted their business and their model and what they've had to do as a result of that. So maybe if you could take us from the top for what that business used to be and then what it's doing now. Sure, sure. So I work for a uh, small, she says, small production company 
um, who concentrate mainly on audiobooks. Mm. So content for themselves and for uh, things like Audible is probably how most people know audiobooks. They work in, we work in kind of a niche market where we're really looking at like classic sci-fi mm. and that sort of thing. Uh, we have licenses to look after some really cool properties like Blake Seven, uh, Doctor Who. Cool. Which is which yeah. is a big one. Everyone knows. Everyone knows Doctor Who. Uh, Captain Scarlet. Yeah. Other things from from Jerry Anderson and and such. So it, it's kind of cool stuff, and it, it's great to be able to to play with those worlds. Um, it started off. In, the company was incorporated in 1996. I think they released their first stuff in 1999, mm-hmm. and I joined six years ago. Okay. Um, and when it first started, it was all about cassette tapes mm. and CDs. Cool. I was just going to say, yeah, this would be like right bang in that kind of prime CD time, like 12.99. Yeah. Releases, fifteen pound ninety nine releases. That's sort of stuff. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Okay, cool. So that's the breadwinner. Is you've got like this sort of model where you're you you're getting licenses to record or re-record or re-release sci-fi so stuff. No, or? these are we generally do new stories within the worlds of whatever we're doing. So we work wherever we can uh, with the original actors. So we work with a lot of very cool people like Tom Baker, Colin Baker, Sylvester McCoy, um, David Tennant, mm. uh, Christopher Eccleston's just come on board, which is very exciting for us. So it's, it's very much classic Doctors all the way through to what they call the new era. And it's all new stories. We have also looked at stories that never actually got made. Oh, right. So obviously with something like Doctor Who, the ideas were sometimes much bigger than the BBC budget. Okay, right. So people wrote these amazing stories. Yeah. And they're like, yeah, it's going to be set on this, like, mechanical asteroid. That's And the BBC are like, yeah, no. Nah. Yeah. No, we, we, we can't do that. <laughs> they're like, yeah. Then then 10 TARDIS. Is, well, what's the plural for TARDIS? Is it TARDI? Tardi? Yeah. 10 <laughs> TARDI appear and all explode and, like, all the buildings around them catch fire, like, BBC and producers then it's Godzilla. Like, and not. then, yeah, <laughs> can we just, we're going to dial that back a bit. Yeah. And you're going to go to Brighton. Yeah. And leave <laughs> yeah. the pier. You, yeah. I'll tell you what you get. You get a TARDIS on a rocky beach. That's what you get. Yeah. yeah. So there, there's, like, there's loads of cool stuff out there, like stories that never got made uh, or things we've had ideas for and they weren't picked up because they wanted to go into blah, 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 blah. Anyway, so we used to produce cassettes and CDs, and then as time went on, people still really liked the stuff. So we we now then started to do download to own. Mm-hmm. So we have a website, and people can download it, and we cool. have an app now as well. So, Lovely. And you can see where this is going. Yeah. So as people start to consume things in different ways, we try to follow those so we can give our customers they want Mm -hmm. you know how they want to consume their yeah so this would be like a sort of your own proprietary version of Mm -hmm. itunes basically so you would have a platform or an app or whatever that would serve the content to the sci-fi fan uh you get to keep all of the money Mm -hmm. because it's your platform or whatever they get it on their phone and then you've kept up with the trend or whatever the only downside to that i guess is that most people have iTunes or, you know, some, mm-hmm. some sort of Apple thing on their iPhone. Not everyone yeah. has your app, right? That's mm-hmm. okay. Cool. So, yeah. So then we had to look at how to manage that. And we started to look at streaming and how streaming platforms would work and how then it would work for our contributors. Yeah. See, we could always see how it would work for us because we go and say, hi there, we've got all this content. It's all ready made. It's all got its metadata sorted and everything. Put it on your platform. Give us a cut. Great. But then how does that actually really work for our contributors? Mm. All Because we have a royalty structure in place. So if you contribute to a production, you get a percentage 
of the profits that we get. And with a CD, that was really easy mm. because it's like we have sold a thousand CDs. Yeah. It cost us this much to make it. So that, that takes out, but these are our receipts and here's your percentage. Here's your percentage. Thank you very much. With streaming, it's kind of a different thing. And I think that's one of the issues for us now is working out how that works when the percentages are quite skewed from the bigger streaming prep platforms which is why we've kind of kept it in-house at the moment and just used our own app mm. and kind of kept it like that because it it feels like the big streaming platforms yeah just don't really work for the small contributors i guess that's that's where it sort of overlaps with uh struggling artists right like on, mm -hmm. on labels or independent artists uh is historically they would be selling their albums for like you know 10.99 up to 17 quid for like a premium artist um and now they're in a position where they have to begrudgingly accept the strict like because nobody's buying cds anymore and nobody's really buying like yeah. why would you buy an album off itunes if you can just stream it for free <laughs> like so i mean yeah. e even if you pay yeah. spotify premium uh, on a monthly basis and it's like 12 quid or 15 quid a month you're not it's not going to work out the same uh reward wise like financially mm -hmm. reward wise um as it would have done if somebody had you know paid 15 quid for that album um and so i suppose the parallel there with you guys is that yeah you're at the mercy well you're either at the mercy of these streaming platforms or you have to go it alone and stay you know truly independent but it must worry you that if you if you stay independent the longer that you do that, then like someone else is going to come along and do the exact same thing that you're doing, except put it on Spotify or, you know? Absolutely. And it's also the, the reach then. I mean, we can reach a certain number of people with our, you know, our social media output, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. But people aren't necessarily going to stumble across our stuff and just be like, Hey, that was really good. Mm. I, I'm, I'm going to get, an, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to look those guys up. I'm going to get more of that because we're, we're, a, we're a niche company anyway. Because you know, not not everybody, not everybody loves sci-fi. Not everyone loves classic sci-fi. No, they're wrong if they don't. But that's fine. You know, people have different tastes. But yeah, so we're we're already a niche market within. A niche market, if you know what I mean, because not everyone likes audiobooks, not everyone likes audio plays, you know, again. Yeah. And so then restricting yourselves further by not just being out there where people go, oh, I may as well give it a go. Yeah, that's an interesting point, actually. So it's kind of like, I mean, one, one of the benefits or famous benefits of the Internet is that you might be kind of niche. But the fact that the internet goes everywhere, like all over the world, you could build up a pretty good following for, let's say, a podcast that is mm -hmm. solely about uh, Ferris Bueller's Day Off. You know, it's just yeah. like endless, like every episode is about some other <laughs> angle about Ferris Bueller. But even though that's a super niche uh, subject, there are people out there, there would be sufficient numbers of people out there who love Ferris Bueller's Day Off, who would yeah. listen to that avidly like every week. Um, and so for them, the internet and streaming and, you know, whatever else uh, works really, really well. But you're sort of stuck in this rock and a hard place of like, you know, you don't want to get bent over a barrel by the low rates of pay by the streaming. Mm -hmm. But you're also shutting yourself off from that mass market benefit of the internet. Yeah, right. Absolutely. And then it's, it's you know, it's, it's, it is business decisions about how... You do that, and I guess it's it's kind of even more difficult for for artists mm. who, you know. So the choice is with say a music artist is you you go it alone, mm -hmm. or you try and sign to a label. Yeah, you go it alone. I mean, you've suddenly got to learn to be a whole load of things. You've, you, yeah, this is really like. I respect you know, people who can do all of that stuff. Like I, I yeah. watched a video earlier where someone was talking about Chance the Rapper and about mm -hmm. how he stayed independent his whole time. And I was like, well, that's great for him. 
Yeah. But it's like, what if you're actually a really talented songwriter or rapper or whatever, but you act, yeah. you're not that good at marketing or like schmoozing or, you know, so now does that person deserve to be trampled all over? It's like. Yeah. And also you go, maybe you go with the record label because then they have people to do all those things that mm. you're not good at. You're, you're amazing at the xylophone, but you're rubbish at social media, you know, whatever. Yeah. But then the problem with a lot of the big, the bigger labels is they're still looking at things like so their deals tend to be the same as they were historically now historically they had to take into account they had to make your yeah. music available to people so they had to manufacture a record mm. or a cd or a cassette or whatever yeah and so those deals still do that but actually they're not having to do that anymore because they don't make cds for every artist yeah i've heard this actually where like, like you say like not to paraphrase you but basically like 20 30 years ago when they had to factor in the cost of pressing a cd or pressing a vinyl or mm. you know contracting that out to a vinyl pressing plant um they would hive off a certain amount of money and the bands you know back in the day the rolling stones or whoever would sign this contract and go like yeah okay well yeah that makes sense yeah. Yeah, uh, I'm not, I'm not going to go and do it. I'm not going to, I don't know any vinyl pressing plants. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, and now it's just like, oh, well, yeah, I mean, we'll probably just leave that in there. I'm like, sometimes I wonder who the fuck are the lawyers that are representing these art, or do the artists just not have solicitors? Or is it like. Well, again, I mean, the thing is, you probably, when you renegotiate your contract, if you've done well, then you probably do have a good music solicitor. Mm. But at the beginning, maybe you have your mate sister who's a paralegal you know yeah it, and she's read it and it's not going to totally screw you over but she's not actually a music lawyer yeah she's just somebody you know because otherwise again you've got to you've got to pay a music lawyer and to be fair these people have gone to university spent a lot of money getting their yeah. degrees and, and becoming a music lawyer so they cost money to hire mm. Yeah, and I suppose that's not something that the like the record label advance would necessarily cover. <laughs> like, it's not in the label's interest to give you good representation to fight. No. Yeah, yeah, it's funny. And then there's the flip side of that situation as well. So, um, you know, historic uh, vinyl pressing costs that the label would want uh, to recoup from you uh, is is wound up in the contract. But then now there is the equivalent of that, which is well, not equivalent of, but um, where artists will make millions and millions of dollars out of their merchandise and their instagram and like product placement and that sort of stuff and now mm -hmm. the labels are like well hang on a second nobody's buying cds anymore guys and you know we're marketing you we're spending three hundred thousand dollars marketing you so you can be a hit so we think it's only fair that because we put we, you on that we platform, get a little yeah we get a little bit of that too yeah <laughs> Slice of that as well. Yeah, and so they call it a 360 deal. So it covers mm -hmm. everything. It's like it's you know we don't just make the music. We we promote you. We will take a cut of your merchandise. We'll take a yeah like all of your social media earnings and um, it's crazy. It's like it makes me think. Are record com like at what point do we stop looking at record labels as record labels, and do we actually look at them like oh you're a marketing agency? That's what you are. Yeah. Like. You you have the contacts. You put me on the Tonight Show or you know Top of the Pops or whatever, and then <laughs> Top of the Pops. Yeah, I'll show you how how much my... they've got a time machine as well. <laughs> yeah, this is a technology show, and my finger is on the pulse, Emily. <laughs> right on that pulse. Yeah. So let's let's go back to your business. Um. So what's how how has the business model changed now? How have they had to respond to this? Well, the the kind of the choice is now mm -hmm. do we stop physical uh releases completely so that's a big question that we've had because we still do have a cd pressing plant oh right it's not ours i mean we we use them mm. um and what we've realized is there are a lot of people out there who like who still like a thing mm. they like to own the thing yeah and they like to look at the, the the notes and the credits and they don't just want it on their screen. They're like a thing. So it's it's actually worthwhile for to do a much a, a much smaller pressing. So we don't press anywhere near the amount that we used to, mm. but we will do a limited press of a, a particular release. 
Um, we also do limited vinyl pressings of some releases, and they sell really, really well yeah. to people who that is their thing. They like to have a collection. Yeah. You know, they like something tangible. Um, and then you have the people who like to download, who would never stream because they like download to own. They want right. to own that production. So they will pay you money mm -hmm. and then they will own that production. And then you've got a whole bunch of people now who have just got so used to the way that things have gone. They don't actually care mm. that they're only renting it from streaming. Right. Okay. Because that's, there was a, I remember years ago, a few, quite a few years ago now, Steve Jobs said, oh, people, will, um, it'll never go anywhere because people like to own the thing. Yeah. But I think that mentality has completely changed over the, past couple of years mm. because there's there's so much out there and you can always reaccess it if you know if if you lose your phone you just re-download your apple and you've got mm. all your stuff back and if they decide that they you don't have it anymore you just be like oh well i'll just get it off spotify then well it also underestimated the uh like the business trend of moving aggressively into subscription services so mm -hmm. like i'm reminded of that um there's a Chris Rock stand-up bit where he's, I can't remember what he's talking about now, ph pharmaceuticals or something. And like, he says, <laughs> he says like, there's no money in the cure, like the money's in the medicine. So they won't cure like AIDS. They'll just find a way for you to like live with it where you just have to, Manager. you know, go back to the doctor and go, like, oh, here's another hundred dollars. Where's my, you know, and, and it's kind of like, it's, it sounds like a crass parallel to draw, but it's kind of the same with tech. Because you could, historically, you could like go out and just buy a TV and you own the TV. And you go out and you buy a sofa and you own a sofa. But with tech products, progressively, it's stuff like you don't just buy Spotify and then you own it. They want you to keep spending money every month and the, month, like, the money mm -hmm. comes in. Netflix is the same. Like They don't want you to just buy a Netflix box. They want you to be coughing up like a tenner a month. So they've always got that income. And uh, I guess it's the same with... You know with steve jobs uh prediction of like you know people will want to own well yeah i'm sure they would love to but there's more money you know the the capitalists that lead society have decided mm -hmm. that there's more money if you just continuously ask people to spend it every month it's, it's also see that that's the other thing with, with something like a subscription model mm. is it's it's actually quite good for business because you can base your decisions on known factors. Mm. So if you know that this many people have got this particular thing for this long, yeah. you know how much money you have. Yeah. So you base your core on that and then you, you know, imagine that you're because of this marketing push, you're going to get this many more subscribers and this many people will drop out and blah. But it's it's actually a very good way um for businesses to work because they they've got a clear idea of of where they're at yeah with their cash flow at any given point so it works it works nicely for them mm. however going back to you know your sort of you musicians mm. the, the fun thing about the whole subscription thing is yeah i might be only listening to insane clown posse but none of my money would go to them no. because of the pro rata thing they'd be so low down yeah on that list that i'm actually paying for ed sheeran yeah it's that that's a weird thing isn't it because it's like wait i've 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 bored her off camera sorry i'm very <laughs> sorry my, my dog <laughs> it's like that whole thing of being at home and, and things my dog decided to come into the dining room yeah and has then decided he wants to leave again so we're starting to bark and oh right that would be quite distracting for everyone so yeah. i apologize yeah, that's all right um yeah um I can't remember what I was going to say now. What was I going to say? In terms of, oh yeah, right. So historically, uh, the PRS would, which if anyone's listening and they don't know what the PRS is, it's like a, a non-profit agency which collects um, royalty payments, basically. So if you if you run a radio station or you open a shop and you play the radio in the shop, then you pay a license and then the PRS divvy up everything based on what they Absolutely. think is being played on the radio. And now we're in a situation where progressively this is 
kind of irrelevant because everyone's listing on streaming services so why would you then need to pay a prs license if you're already paying for the music through spotify and then it should be up to spotify to divvy up that money and you would think that uh -huh. with a platform like spotify where everything is data driven and it's all algorithms and databases you'd think it would be quite fair wouldn't you that they could it has emerged that that is not the case no I know. And it's hooky as fuck as well. Like if you read this stuff about, um, I think Tidal did this as well, where... Yeah, the, the, uh, false plays yeah. and certain people got pushed right up uh, oh, and yeah. they got a big slice of pie. So they get like automated plays uh, at, at like some, some people's accounts between the hours of like one and five in the morning, basically when they knew that these people would not be listening or using their accounts, they played like a Beyonce track like another million yeah. times or something. And yeah, so then they get more of a cut of the the subscription money. So there's that. Mm -hmm. But then there's also this other thing with Spotify where they've got these unknown artists. And I was like, who the fuck is this guy? And it's like, yeah. you know, it's his, his name is like, you know, JL Cooks or something. And uh, I listen to a lot of like sort of instrumental jazzy hip hop because I'm insufferable and uh <laughs> yes. and uh and it would come on to this guy and i was like oh, i've not heard this before who's this it sounds a bit budget and then like, i click on his thing and it's like there's two tracks on there but they've both been played hundreds of thousands of times and then i like mm -hmm. i'm like i quite like it though i google for him it's no nice. fucking sign of him he doesn't exist yeah. so like these are obviously and it's not just me sort of you know being a bit uh pedantic about who i listen to it's like you know, there's journalists that have looked into this and they're like, there's a hundred yep. artists who have no, there's no trace of them anywhere. And yet they've got, you know, hundreds of thousands of listens. Who the fuck are these people? And the only logical explanation is that Spotify have got house bands, house artists to record dummy tracks so they can just play, like throw them in your playlist. So it's like one less or like 10 less artists that they need to pay royalties for, like... It's hooky as fuck, man. Yeah, it 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 really is, and, and when you do look into the to that, you sort of see how broken the model is. Yeah, and how how much it doesn't work. And sorry, you were saying about PRS. Now, the other thing about about that is uh, recently mm. we've all been inside because pandemic. Sorry to mention you know Bring out the pandemic on, yeah. on a tech podcast but people haven't been able to go to the bar people haven't been able to go to the hairdressers people haven't been able to go to any of these places that play music mm. and so music hasn't been being played there so they a lot of people didn't renew their prs license and it was fine because their premises were, were closed i know yeah the community pub that i run we were able to not pay our prs for uh, like six months yeah. because we were legitimately closed and like who the fuck is listening to this yeah who's so, listening to this music yeah. <laughs> yeah so yeah i mean that and um, pos is a, a way that a lot of musicians make money because yeah. it's it was quite a it's quite a decent decent amount at as opposed to the tiny percentage of a penny that they would get for a stream. So, yeah. And so now I suppose they're double fucked with it. So have the PRS, yeah. are they, are the, are the PRS still dishing out royalties then based on that? Or are the, all of these artists going super hungry now? Um, well, I mean, I was, I was looking at some, some things and it was, I think it was Katie Turnstall mm. was, was saying that, a lot of people that she's spoken to have seen, you know, they were getting decent royalty checks from PRS and suddenly yeah. come pandemic, nothing because yeah. they weren't collecting anything anymore because everywhere that used them yeah. was shut. It's really tough. Like I think for anyone that's in the creative space at the moment is uh, mm. like, I follow some Absolutely. comedians on Twitter and they've got blue ticks next to their name uh, and they've been on TV and everything and you would think oh well yeah they must have some money in the bank and you know but i think like anyone or like most people you know they were working at it and they got a few tv gigs and the money went in the bank and then they had a holiday and you know to to some extent rightly or wrongly they were living month to month hand to mouth and then as soon as this pandemic hit 
and the TV work dried up and uh, all of the live shows dried up and um, and now they're li- like one lady's literally just working in a supermarket and I'm I'm like yeah. fucking hell yeah. like that's some humble pie to go from you know making a thousand people in a theatre laugh and being on TV and then you know in a space of two I... weeks you're like can I have a job please awesome. I also think that that people kind of have a bit of a what should I say um obviously just being on tv is, just, is great just come and out with it but it doesn't pay as well as people think yeah if you're doing like a guest spot on something yeah yeah you get paid but you don't get paid a huge amount i mean yeah if you win i'm a celebrity you i think you get like 100 grand or something yeah but most people aren't getting that for being a guest spot on something yeah i've heard this as well actually so i i used to gig with a guy when i, I first started out and he became pretty big um and i was chatting with a friend of mine i was like just as i was sort of winding everything down and becoming a father and i was like i just fucking miss it and you know some of the guys that i started with and now they're getting like management deals and like tv what yeah like their own tv shows and shit and i'm like what the like i'm i'm just sat here like with my baby and like (laughs) a handful of poo it like and it like it's it's how i imagine was it yours or the babies? Because I'm hoping it was the babies. Really. <laughs> a little bit of both, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. But it's um, how I imagine a lot of new mums feel when they're, you know, famously, you know, they're stuck in a house with a screaming baby and the, the, the life is just passing them by out, outside and they mm-hmm. just feel like they're missing out and they're stuck with this. But be- like, and I, you know, I love my kids, but it's, you know, there's that yearning of like, what would I, what would have become of that if I hadn't have become a parent at this exact moment yeah and um and anyway so i was i was ranting off to a friend of mine about it and uh he was like i i really wouldn't worry about it because you know the the guys that you're mentioning who have these shows he he was like they still live with their parents like it's not good money it's okay and it's fame but it's not like they're really and in some ways actually that kind of brings us back to like musicians because you know back in the day fucking michael jackson or like the Rolling Stones would be selling what, like 10 million copies, 20 million copies of an album. And that would be it. Private jets, mansions, uh, you know, like uh, they'd buy islands, (laughs) like like fucking islands. Actual, actual islands. Yeah. And now it's it's like, what? It's just not the same. No. Yeah. And like, how weird is this? Is that still on like music videos and stuff, they'll be like in a Bentley, or outside like a, a stately home with like girls in a pool and you know ferrari and a, a driver yeah you've got to have a tiger on a like gold leash thing yeah that's important like an albino leopard or something like next to them like the the, the height of opulence like not just lottery winner money you know not like three mil in the bank kind of stuff but like fucking hedge fund money oligarch kind of house i mean didn't didn't elton john bless him once famously spent quarter of a million pounds one year on flowers. Mm. Right. Just just having flowers, great big, you know, yeah. every day someone would come and change in, in every room and blah, 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 blah. Yeah, great. That was quarter of a million pounds on flowers. Yeah. <laughs> but he fits exactly into that old school, you know, sell, mm-hmm. selling out stadiums, selling 10 million copy albums. George Michael, another one. Yeah, uh, Queen, oh, like all of that sort of period of like nineteen, anything from the late sixties up to the late eighties, I guess. And now yeah. it's like, oh, I feel so bad for these kids today. These kids today, uh, <laughs> but like when they they're like, I'm going to start a band, man, because that's how that's how you get, you know, I'm going to get rich. I believe in my songs, and I, you know, I believe in my talent, and that's how you get money and chicks and big house and and like it's. Like, I think if you've got your head screwed on or you have any understanding of streaming and the music industry and royalties and stuff, you're like, no, mate, that's... Uh, right, I'm going to give you I'm gonna give you some numbers, but I, I just double-checked this earlier. Sure, yeah. I, I just looked it up. So there's a guy, and he used to be in a band called The Long Pigs, um, great indie band. They're always on, like, the best indie anthems or whatever. Okay. It's always she said. Um, he co-wrote a song 
in 2013 and it was released by Jake Bug, who was quite well known yeah. and doing the thing. And after millions of plays on YouTube and two years later, he got £158. Yeah, doesn't surprise me. How's How fucked is that? Like, that's... That is... I'm trying to think of the right expression. But Jeremy it's... Newman famously has just... You know, this guy is famous. Yeah. And he was like... I printed out my entire uh, royalty statement with all the streams and everything and spent more on the paper yeah. than I actually got paid. Yeah. It's like, like even ba back in the day, when I went to university, uh, they always said, you know, the smartest person in the band is probably the songwriter because yeah. if you write anything in that song, whether you're, you know, a, a Robbie Williams like co-writer or if you're the actual songwriter... Um, yeah, Gary Barlow. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> we usually take that for some reason. Okay, cool. <laughs> we, we usually take that here as a, as a good example. But, like, yeah. if you if you write the songs back in the day in the old world, um, you would that would be lucrative because you would, mm -hmm. for every copy that was sold, you would get an extra few percent of the money. And so the yep. songwriters always make significantly more than the, you know, pretty singer. Um, but now even that is fucked. It's like if you wrote the song... You like who's but no one's buying copies of it, <laughs> so again you're fucked. It's like you might I suppose you might make very slightly more, but if the, if the whole like artistic piece to that streaming uh, paradigm is like um, is naught point naught 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 seven, which is what like I was doing some reading on this earlier, and it says yeah, so YouTube pay the least at naught point naught 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 seven dollars per play and i did some maths on it i was like uh in order to make one dollar on youtube you have to have your song played 142,000 times and i'm like that's a hit like if you get your song played by 142,000 people bothered to listen to your song for longer than 30 yeah. seconds by the way like if it's less than 30 yeah. they don't pay you anything so it's like no. <laughs> 142k listens and you get a dollar for it i'm like this is so fucked and then I don't know if you saw the the interview with um, I forget the, the chap's name now, but uh, he's the CEO of Spotify. Something Eck is it? Daniel Eck? Is it Will or something? I can't remember. I can't remember. His but name. Yeah. But yeah, he's the the head honcho at Spotify, and uh, he said like somebody asked him a question at the end of a, like a TED talk or something, and they said, you know, what do you make of all of the discontent? All of the artists seem very upset. You know, they put in all of this work. And then the work goes out to the public and it's a hit, but they make fucking no money on it. And he said his response or his way rather of justifying it was he said, you know, a lot of these artists these days, uh, they they seem to think that it's OK to take four years to write and record an album. And then that's it. They can just put this album out uh, and just sit back and, you know, coast on their laurels for, for another four years. He's like, it's not enough in the 21st century to just put one album out every three or four years. And so mm. I was like, all right, I know how I feel about that as a, as a music fan. How, how does that make you feel hearing that? Well, you see that, I mean, to me, that's, that's just crazy because it doesn't work. It doesn't work that way when you're creating something, I, I don't think, but that is the problem that we have now mm. is every single year, more people are connecting to the internet. I mean, they reckon about half the world's population is currently connected to the internet. Mm -hmm. But in the next 10 years with 5G and everything, it's going to be more like, you know, 90% of the world's going to be connected to the internet. So there's going to be more consumers. So the more consumers they are, mm. the more content they need. And, you know, it's, it's, it's crazy because these streaming platforms act like they're the product. Yeah. But they're not. No. They're just delivering the product, but they act like they're the product. Whereas it's actually the guys who are taking time to, you know, create mm. something that the product, but that's kind of getting lost Yeah, because they can't do it because it's taking them four years to write an album. There are a load of other people who will do it. And, but then the know, quality goes down, doesn't it? It's like, does it? Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's the thing, isn't it? I mean, there are some really good things about streaming. I mean, 
more people have got so much more access to more music and you know there are small DIY artists who have had have have had success. Mm. I mean, let's let's not pretend that that no one's done well out of this because there are sure. people who have just you know taken off and gone from you know seeing down the dog and duck to suddenly mm. you know having four million subscribers on YouTube and of whatever it is. Those are just numbers. Yeah, anyway. that's that's an important point to make as well, isn't it? It's like there's like I I pay a subscription to spotify and i have to say like credit where it's due i don't know what magic they work with their algorithm <laughs> but it is magic and uh every monday i look forward to starting my play- playlist off to see what like little gems they found me and there's there have been artists that i found on there where i fucking love them it, like it's it's it is art in the truest sense and i get excited about music in a way that i had not done for years so they have that in their corner that they've been able to Mine's do Mine's a tuesday because i have apple music so my my playlists come out on a tuesday and i'm just like oh this is great yeah. or it will be something that i haven't listened to for years and years and years and i'm like oh, i love this mm. like oh my gosh and it's something that i just had fallen out of my brain and you know, yeah. I hadn't thought about for, and it's like, this is brilliant. Yes. Yeah. Let's listen to a bit of shoe gaze or whatever it is, you know, some random thing that they've decided that I want, which I always do. But I suppose where but yeah, so there are good things. And I think the the best yeah. thing that's come out of streaming, I guess, is it's sort of stopped piracy in a way. <laughs> yeah. That's a, that's because another good thing to say. Yeah. It's the point is people used to pirate music. Mm-hmm. And now you can do that legit. So m- most most people don't really want to be doing things that are illegal, mm. and also it harm their computer. Mm. You know, definitely from LimeWire or whatever it was. Yeah, you end up with like fucking five <laughs> Trojans and a yeah, <laughs> just destroying your own PC, and being like what's the name? Porn pop ups on your mum's login, <laughs> and what the fuck yeah. is this? What have you been doing? Uh, I don't nothing. know. Wasn't me. I just wanted a Metallica album. Uh, I just wanted to listen to Limp Bizkit. Yeah, but but yeah, but now you can with you you know your subscription stuff. You can basically do that legitimately. So who's going to pirate things when it's so easy to do it legitimately? That's true. Yeah. So you know, in a in a crazy way, at least pe- I know people are getting peanuts, but at least they're getting something. Where there it used to be, people <laughs> would just pirate. At least stuff. they're getting peanuts and, aid, like. <laughs> yeah i mean it's like i i i get it and i understand that it's super tough for them and that mm-hmm. the money that they do get from places like spotify and let's remember it's not just spotify it is yes let, we're not we're not blaming no, anyone here it's uh, i've got my <laughs> list here it's youtube pandora spotify google deezer amazon all of them pay shit um yeah. and, and the, i guess the thing that irks people about it is when they read about these obscene profits like amazon possibly i don't know if i'm speaking utter shit here but like it, they've got to be the most profitable company in the world in the last year especially with everyone being at home and just ordering themselves like feel better gifts and shit like i know i've ordered i'm like do you know that scene in dumb and dumber where he like the guy says just go in there and get the essentials all right don't spend money we're on a very tight budget don't don't spend money unnecessarily and then he comes out with like a fucking stupid cowboy hat and like a little wind blowy like like that's me i'm just buying junk every week to make myself feel better you bought a what candelabra candelabra fucking yes i will will show you you can see this right and i didn't check the size of the candelabra so it was supposed to be like a little one that you could put on the table Mm. right it's (laughs) that's bold I like that. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's an interior design statement that I have made. If I came to dinner... Yeah, I, I bought stuff like candelabras. Cause... If I came to dinner and that was on the table with, like, candles in it, I'd be like, what the fuck have I walked into? Like, what, yeah. what are we celebrating? Oh, no, I'd be sacrificing you, oh, music. Okay. <laughs> okay. an unfortunate turn. Um, But, yeah, like, so, so going back to, like, the streaming stuff, it's, yeah, it's important to remember that... Uh, it wasn't like everything was fucking amazing before Spotify. Like no. things were terrible for for artists with uh, like albums getting stolen and uh, yeah, like torrenting and Napster and and so on. So in yeah. that way, it is a solution to that problem. 
Uh, and I suppose there's an argument there that if they raised the monthly figure, would it just send people back to torrenting or would they lose subscribers to like Tidal or Amazon Music? I don't really know. See, that's that's the, that's the problem that, that they that those companies have is, you know, they've kind of got all these people over from doing things they shouldn't be doing mm. to doing things they should be doing. But then, the, I mean, the other the other suggestions that are out there in the world are literally like a four way split. Yeah. So the streaming platform gets a quarter. The label gets a quarter if there is one. If there isn't a label, it's a three way split. The songwriter gets a quarter, and then the performers have a quarter. Okay. And that's a way to look at it. Is just as I said, it just seems like. The royalty system hasn't evolved anywhere near as quickly as the technology, and it just is not really working. Because I don't honestly believe, as a sort of a mid-level, you know, band or whatever, it must be absolutely heartbreaking not to be able to do this full time. To be, mm. to have to put on work, and like you said, still have to, like with your comedian friend, still have to go and have another job. Yeah, because the job you really want to do and that you're really good at and that people really love, you know, you're being streamed millions of times. Mm. People like what you're doing, but there's no way you can properly do it yeah. because you get a million plays and you get 158 quid. Well, I'll tell you what, that's not going to pay the rent. Yeah. Yeah. And it, like, so I, I think I mentioned this to you in our, in our initial phone call that we had, but uh, I've got a friend who's in a signed band uh, and they've had, three albums out i think mm -hmm. uh and i used to use some of his music on my i used to do like like low low rent like comedy documentary like a, a week <laughs> a week in the life of a open mic comedian for youtube and um and i i used to put his stuff on there and i thought it was really good and uh uh and he he's played a few like you know pretty decent venues and i think they've gone on tours mm -hmm. and shit and anyway like I, I remember him posting a rant on facebook saying you know if we given the amount of interest that we have on these platforms uh, and the people that come to our shows, he was like, I've worked out that if we had come out in like the late nineties or early noughties, this would be our full-time job and we would yeah. be making all right wedge. But because like almost, I don't think he said it this brutally, but like basically directly because of this streaming paradigm, they are all working like other jobs. They have to yeah. supplement this shit. Mm -hmm. um yeah it's crazy isn't it it's I mean, nuts you think about like blur or somebody like that mm. right blur were huge they did a thing and then they retired and went to have a cheese farm and did crazy crap like that that's a dream there is no way yep. that that guys are going to be able to do that no now there's no you cheese know? factory for you pal no no cheese farm no no organic cheeses it's it's quite sad isn't it because it's like imagine what that guy's alex james isn't it that runs the cheese yeah. thing has he got kids? Imagine what his kids must be like. Like, I'd love to be a rock star like my dad. Well, the thing then... is, his wife was like, "We're doing what?" And he's like, "Yeah, I'm. I've really, I'm really, really sick of being a rock star. So we're going to move to the country and uh, make cheese." And she's like, "Meh, we we'll give it a go." Yeah. So off they went and had a lovely time. Fair play to her. I mean, it must yeah. be it must be quite a shift to sort of you know you hook up with a guy who's a rock star. We're in London. You're in yeah. the scene, you're doing the parties, you're doing the things, you're getting invited to openings and whatever and yeah. stuff. And then you're, he's like, nah, 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 I'm out. Wait, here's a weird question. What do you think? You know when you meet people and they say, no, I don't drink anymore. And you think, ah, you used to be a massive pisshead. And yeah. then, and there's always a part of you that's like, what was the night? What was <laughs> what? What was the night that you did whatever it was that you did? What did you do? Yeah. What did you do? Yeah. yeah, that made you tip over into all right. I gotta fucking calm this shit down. This is yeah. I'm not. I can't. Can't anymore. Yeah. This is just too far. You know. Um, I'm also barred from Bath. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Like what? Like what is it? There's a story there. Tell me the fucking story. Yeah. Um. And I, I wonder, like, so what makes you leave behind a multi-platinum band like Blur and just go like, right, I just got to fucking move to Devon and make cheese. Make cheese. Yeah. 
And what like his wife must have been in on it. There must have been some fucked up night where she like she was so appalled at his behaviour. Like, all right, listen, if if that's how you're going to be, we need to get you out of here. We need to. We're either either I'm out of here, or we're going to Devon. Yeah. Or like it's like one of these one of these awkward argument like non arguments actually with like your partner where he'd be like, listen, I've given this a lot of thought, and last weekend was really fucked, and um, I just think actually maybe we should just take the kids and move to Devon and make cheese and then she's like there's a second of silence where she's like I think that's a really good idea I think that's a really good I idea I think that's for the best yeah yeah <laughs> because I'll never be able to look at a llama the same way again yeah I think we yeah I think we need to go those animals did nothing to you yeah <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so here's here's my my counter argument. Let's just bring this back back on top. Okay, yeah. So here's my counter argument to, you know, the, the I, I get the whole you know artists should be paid more, and it isn't fair that they're only paid this much out of every play and so on. But is there an argument where you say, okay, well look, back in the day, in let's start with the '60s, there was like two channels on TV. And if you wanted to get big, you go on in the States, it would be the Ed Sullivan show. And over here, it would be Top of the Pops. If you weren't on one of those two things, you're fucked. So those were your options to get your message out to all of your would-be fans. Uh, then there was like, you know, let's bring it forward to like the 70s, the 80s. There's like... Fanzines. Four channels. Well, fanzines, yeah. But like, I'm talking, you know, mainstream million... Mm -hmm selling albums to make a real like big impact you'd have to be on these you know these mainstream channels or or pirate radio in the 60s but like anyway as time went on more channels more radio stations um and then uh digital like t like sky tv more stations there like mtv came out mm -hmm. suddenly you've got all of these places that people can access music and get exposed to different types of music and it's not just 10 songs on top of the pops on friday night or whatever it's fucking thousands of songs and they have to pick a favorite each week and so then we spool forward to like you know 2021 we've got not just you know a thousand radio stations that could play one song like you've got entire radio stations set to like niche genres where like if i just want to listen to 90s hip-hop I can listen to like absolute radio 90s hip hop, right? So yeah. there's no chance I'm ever going to hear the new song by like Jay Diller or whatever. So, <laughs> Your mate. yeah. So, like, it's, is there an art? Right. Here's, here's the point I'm getting to is that with this sort of huge mass of music and exposure and different ways that you could experience it, is an album and a song actually just worth less now? I think that ultimately depends on the consumer right. and how much they value it. But I, I get, I do, I do take what you're saying. Absolutely. There is just, I mean, like you say, if you just wanted to listen to nineties hip hop, you could easily do that. Yeah. You could, that's not a problem. Mm. And you would never have to listen to anything else. Nothing would interrupt your days of Coolio. You know, you'd, you'd be having nice. a lovely time. Yeah. But it's but, like if you look at it, it's supply and demand. Yeah. It's like if there's so much supply. But I, yeah. I think there's more of a reach as well now. So, like you say, it used to be you got you got big in the you might be big in the UK, but you might not be known anywhere. There's a load of bands, and it it became sort of a bit of a joke. Oh, they're huge in Japan. Yeah, big in Japan. Yeah. And and things like that. But now, I guess. With the whole streaming thing, you get, you could be. Yeah. It might be that in the future, people take a sort of, I don't know if you, are you familiar with the comedian Doug Stanhope? Yeah. No, he's, uh, Not gonna lie. so <laughs> that's actually kind of good because it sort of feeds into my point, but like <laughs> he, so he's a very niche kind of USP, uh, stand up in the States and, uh, he does very, you know, grotesque, very offensive. Not like a lot of it is hard to listen to, but it's. <laughs> but his whole point is like, you know, he's been touring around in the states for so long, 
that he's appalled a lot of people. He's upset a load of people. He's been banned from various clubs and so on. But the people that hate him just won't go and see him again. But the people that love him, love him. Like, they really, really love him. So is it possible that maybe in the future, like, the music industry and, and you know, audio, any sort of audio streaming actually sort of adapts to this kind of, you know, that you're never going to be the number one artist with the big arena tour. But the people that love you will really, really love you and they will pay the extra, like, $40 or yeah. $50 to come and see you because you're exactly what they're into. That, see, that that's the interesting thing because, um, I mean, people have been doing... Obviously, it's been a weird time because of the pandemic, but people have been... There was a guy... Oh God, I can't remember the artist's name. Did a thing on Fortnite, the popular... The video game, yeah. ...game mm -hmm. that I obviously know all about because I'm really cool. Um. But he did a concert within Fortnite. Right. Like a DJ set. That's cool. Yeah. Innovative. And and people, you could like, because it's, um, you can buy content within Fortnite. You can buy better uh, skins for your avatar. You can buy bits and pieces. Yeah. So you could buy like a ticket. And so people just got on Fortnite with their Fortnite buddies from all over the world. Yeah. And watched this DJ do his DJ thing in a, in a virtual setting. Um, other people are doing you know, virtual, like, meet and greets yeah. and stuff. So if somebody's doing a virtual concert, you can get a pay more, log in beforehand and, and have a little virtual Zoom meeting with your, you know, your guy. Yeah. And I think that's an interesting, that's a very interesting thing that if, like you say, if, because it, it used to be, you could almost tell if you were in, like, a big group of people, you can always tell your tribe. Right, yeah. You know, people have got certain band T-shirts on, people have got a way of dressing, people have got this, and you could sort of tell your people. And I think tribes have sort of moved online now, and people will now start to do that because the way, I, I think, if we're honest, the way we consume music has completely changed. Like you say, what is the point of an album nowadays? Yeah. Because people don't listen to albums like they used to. They don't, you know, I, I have a number of albums where I love every song. Like, for example, Californication by the Red Hot Chili Peppers. Mm. That's an album I can just stick on. Yeah. And I'm just like, wow, that was a time in my life. I listened to that album. You know, that was the whole thing. But when I get introduced to new music, it's often a couple of songs I like. And I'm like, oh, I really like Jerry Cinnamon. Mm. But I don't love his whole album. Who was the last so a... artist that you loved their whole album? Oh. Have you found anyone new? Artistically. I'm, t like, I'm, <laughs> I'm terrible. Like, if, you, if I'm going by albums, I love the whole. Yeah. It's like Blink-182 that album that hasn't really got a name. Yeah. We're feeling this and stuff on Californication. Yeah. Jack Little Pill. Um, mm. Yeah. It's, but I don't know that I've found so many albums recently that Do you think that's I would sit. Because, is that because of streaming? Are you just sort of spoiled for choice with streaming? Yeah. yeah. I, I think it's just because I don't, you know, those albums, I'm not sure that I definitely loved them the first time I heard through. Mm. But because I liked, I liked a few of the songs, so I would listen through Tragic Kingdom by No Doubt. You know, I would just put that on yeah. and listen through because there were songs I liked on it. And I grew to love the other songs. Now I don't do that. I'm just like, oh, well, I like Jerry Cinnamon a bit, so I'll put his essentials on. And what it does is it picks... yeah. The songs from the albums that most people like, and you go, yeah, those are all the ones I want to listen to. So I don't bother listening to the albums because I don't have the love for the in between songs where you're actually like, oh, yeah, it's actually like a bit of a creeper. I like this one. I wonder if it's like it's also. I mean, this this is kind of streaming fed, but it's like I remember driving around in my car a lot, and I would like burn a CD of illegally torrented music, uh, <laughs> and uh, I would I'd, I'd drive around listening to like a, a whole album that I had grabbed and 
but the fact that it was in like a cd drive like a 12 cd changer or something like it was too much mm -hmm. fucking effort to like pull the car over and like go in the back yeah, of the seat sorry. like reach under the seat or or go in the boot or whatever and then yeah so you're just like oh this i hate this song but i suppose i'll sit through it and then yeah like through being forced to listen to it it's like oh yeah it's all right i guess last last couple of albums i've listened to where i've liked you know i've, I've really felt it as an album there's one guy called field medic uh who is a great example of somebody who i never would have found mm -hmm. were it not for spotify and i suspect that if we were not in a pandemic that he would be you know he's he's built this fan base on there and i wonder if maybe he would be doing some little stage at reading festival or you know glastonbury yeah. or something so there are people that do benefit like you said um so there was him i love uh, i've listened i've i've devoured his three uh, albums that he's got on there and uh, and then kind of embarrassingly but also secretly not um uh the last taylor swift album uh which was like a totally new direction but it was the fact that it was a new direction and it all like all of the songs had a similar kind of feel to them and I, like it sounds pretentious as fuck but i was a bit like i love the fact that it's like a whole album that's just got like a look and a feel and it's you know all of the songs have got a similar uh soundscape so the, you know. with chapters. it's a what sorry a storybook with chapters yes yeah it feels like it's a you know a product like a real finished piece Thing. yeah instead <laughs> of like one of my my beefs with hip-hop is that you know i love a lot of old hip-hop uh but i find or have found in the last few years that whenever i half like a song when i go to the album every other fucking track is produced by somebody else because they 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 want to it's like a scattergun approach like they want to get every yeah. hot producer on there like oh, i'll have a timberland record then i'll have a dre record and then i'll have a this record like but the output of that is that it then it just sounds like a mixed match like kind of bric-a-brac yeah. album of eh, you know there's no flow yeah there's no, there's no overall doesn't feel like an album like Story. a concept it feels like no. yeah like some dude in marketing is like look do one one trap for the ladies then one trap for the thugs then one trap for the dance floor then one like you know you, and you've got to get one that might be used in an advert when they're being edgy yes yeah yeah that's it um so yeah so i i just a couple more things i wanted to kind of touch on um so i was thinking earlier that like when we were talking about record companies um basically being marketing agencies now Mm -hmm. um and how kind of people are spoilt for choice and potentially like the the value of of a piece of music has has tanked mm -hmm. um is this kind of the same as internet dating right so like back in the day <laughs> right so back in the day imagine you're you're a young woman in the 19th century in a little village and there's a hundred people in the village right your choice of suitor is you know 20 or 30 men young men in that village you just got to pick a guy and you know hopefully he likes you too and then and then that's it right then you come forward the, the least the least drunk and pockmarked yeah yes exactly right so so then we come forward to uh like the 80s and you know people are going like moving to cities and yeah you know, that's a that's a pretty huge jump by the way right 19th century right up to 1980 <laughs> but people like cities appear magically and then people start dating and they meet through friends of friends and they join like dating agencies and the, the dating pool expands quite a lot but it's still kind of shameful to join this dating agency and uh and so people tend to still hook up with friends or friends of friends and they go to parties and so on um and then we get to now or like the last 15 years and there is just this endless conveyor belt of dick or vagina and i was, I was trying to think of what the least offensive <laughs> word vagina was uh so there you go yeah use the technical term got, it's always good got there in the end um i was like wait i'm sure there's a way that people used to say this but not say that um <laughs> 
yeah so so now there's like you know there's tinder and there's bumble and before that there was like my single friend and match and and all this stuff but it's just an endless conveyor belt and so the choice is like limitless and i wonder if you know in the same way that i've i've read blogs about this like where they say this is actually you know it seems like it's solving a problem because it's you know it's introducing you to people that you wouldn't normally meet and it takes the sting out of you know going up to someone in the bar and going oh can i get your number um Hello. but actually it's creating more problems because it's making you think as soon as you get into a half argument with the person you've been seeing for two weeks you're like oh well fuck this guy i'll go back on tinder again <laughs> swipe swipe yeah fine you take me out next week like and and it's the same with guys as well it's just like you know if you 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 meet someone and you've been dating for a month or two and then you know you you might be bored while you're taking a poo and you swipe along yeah it's mad. like there's this this endless choice and so and i say this as a guy who's never been like i met my girlfriend uh i think about six months before tinder took off so we both missed out there i think but um <laughs> <laughs> or, or maybe that was lucky i don't know maybe that was lucky yeah. um but it's like is there a parallel to be drawn there between you know this endless choice of people that you could go out for a drink with and music fans who are just like well you know i listened to oh, i listened to the first 40 seconds of that song oh, i don't know well, it was all right but like back in the day if you bought a cd for 15 quid you'd make sure that you listened to it all twice through just yeah. to make sure that you fucking hated it like and also just to make sure it didn't have like a secret hidden track yeah secret if tracks. you could be the first one to find a secret hidden track you know that was some kudos right there secret tracks are like the sort of forgotten victim of all of this aren't they yeah it's a shame no, never mind never mind had a had a good one it's you'll never get that again and you you probably won't get i hope i'm wrong on this you probably won't get another concept album anytime soon either um i just i don't know who you would market it to yeah well my you'd have to be very very sure of your fan base yeah you'd have to do you think you'd have to take your sort of business's model and go super niche you'd have to develop your own yeah, platform and just, and just do that thing yeah you'd be like look this isn't this isn't itunes guys this isn't spotify no. we all we do is concept albums once a okay. month we drop a theatrical release and uh you know and that's that's how it happens now yeah yeah um okay cool uh right i'm gonna have to <laughs> I'm gonna have to leave it there uh because we're you know we've been chatting for an hour uh and i like Ooh. to cut these things off um a, around the hour mark so um thank you very much for for joining me emily davis and yeah no i hope to have you on again at some point in the future <laughs> well, it, was, it was lovely to be here yeah, yeah. we've had fun it's yeah. been interesting it's been interesting it's been interesting it's been like it's been genuinely really really interesting to hear about like how it's affected the business that you're in because i think like normally people associate streaming and it's um it's it's sort of detrimental yeah, like fee and royalty structure with like solely with musicians and there's very rarely any thought given to businesses that might sort of produce theatrical performances or recordings or like audio books and that also, sort of stuff for people like you know like you say stand-up comedians people like that it's it's all about when you when you produce something nowadays mm. who really owns it because netflix <laughs> netflix yeah. yeah well yeah this the streaming services really because unless you unless you're able to do it on your own which who's able to do that i think there's a I like, guess so here's actually here's a, a last question for you um do you think there's a is there a place for in the same way that porn stars um have kind of broken free if you like and then moved into only fans because they're like you know why do i have to sign to some adult entertainment agency and get paid like you know 500 quid a month to suck a bunch of dicks why do I have to do that when I could just do that? I could literally organize this myself on my own OnlyFans page and I just make all of the money. So like, is there an argument there or, or a sort of model that musicians or uh, audiobook companies could follow where they're like, look, we don't 
want to go the Spotify route and our fans, people that buy our product, are, they really love our product because we're niche and we give them exactly what they want. So we'll set up an account on only, uh, I don't know, only ethical streaming. <laughs> well, like, you know, <laughs> like, <laughs> like, but I could like, you know, I, I know people who would build a platform like that and if like if there was a market for it if they thought that it, it could be lucrative and like it sounds like maybe there might be a market for that i don't know what do you think i think i think there definitely is i think there will always be a market for things like that i think there will always be people out there like i remember when i used to meet people in clubs who always knew the band's concept album before they did the thing uh, before it was actually released and blah 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 there will always be people who like to get in there and who there are a huge number of people who don't like to be corporate mm. and you know would love to be part of like a more sort of indie yeah you know like people who would there are people who would go to our local Woolworths this is because I'm old would go <laughs> to local Woolworths and buy an album yeah or our price yeah virgin yeah mega store and there price. are people who would only buy it from you know an independent store yeah because that's their thing and i think there will always be a market for for the independent for the indie for the you know for that but i think it in the end it just comes down to consumers mm. and how they want to do it and i think people are so used to these subscription models now unless you are one of those people who you know knew the band before they yeah. even formed. I think mostly it's it's the sub- subscription models, but at the same time, there will always be those out there who will forge another path and would prefer to buy from the, the little guy. So, yeah. Nice. Yeah, I hope so. I hope you're right. Um, <laughs> okay, cool. I, I have to leave it there. So, yeah, thanks very much once again, Emily Davis. <laughs> Right, I'm just going to...